Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Salisbury Steak. That's right, when I was a kid, we didn't have smartphones or the internet. All we had was a TV that, if you were lucky, got like three stations. And the only shows on were the news or Ed Sullivan. But we didn't care, because as we watched, we got to enjoy a little something called a TV dinner. And the king of the TV dinners, in my opinion, was the Salisbury Steak, which is what we're going to show you how to make here while at the same time showing you how to make one of the greatest gravies ever invented. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with a pound of ground beef. And for this, I suggest you go right to the meat counter and have them grind it fresh for you. And ideally, you're going to use the 85-15 blend. And what we'll do is spice this up with some freshly ground black pepper, plus a little bit of dry mustard, at which point we'll add a couple very, very key ingredients, which are a couple tablespoons of tomato ketchup, plus a tablespoon of Worcestershire sauce. All right, don't skip that. We'll also sneak in a teaspoon of soy sauce. And then we'll finish up with one beaten egg, a few shakes of cayenne, and then last but not least, some plain breadcrumbs. And then once all that's in there, we'll take a fork and give this a mix until everything is very thoroughly combined. And while it's gonna take a little longer than just using your hands, I think by using the fork, we avoid warming up and mashing in that fat, which can result in a tougher Salisbury steak. So while we do want this very well mixed, the less we handle it, the better. But having said that, because we are using a fair amount of breadcrumbs, even if you did overmix this a little bit, these patties are still going to be pretty tender. So don't stress too much. Oh, and by the way, speaking of breadcrumbs, this is often described as a hamburger steak, but because of what we're throwing in here, this is much, much closer in taste and texture to a meatloaf, which is one of the reasons I love it so much. I am a meatloaf fiend. And then once that's mixed, we could use it right away if we had to. But I think it's much, much better if we pat it down, wrap it up, and place it in the fridge for at least a few hours. Okay, and you can even go overnight if you want. And that's just going to give it a little bit of time for all those flavors to develop. Plus, while that's in the fridge, we can go ahead and whip up our brown gravy, which is going to start by melting a couple tablespoons of butter over high heat in a large nonstick pan, to which we will add a whole bunch of sliced mushrooms, as well as some diced onion and a nice pinch of salt, and what we'll do is saute these stirring occasionally until they're very nicely browned. And the process for what happens to these veggies, I describe as, first we make them wet, then we make them dry, then we make them wet. And what that means is when these first start sauteing, you're going to get a lot of moisture coming out of the mushrooms and the onions, and it will sort of bubble in its own juices and be kind of wet. But as they continue to cook, that water is going to evaporate, and the pan will dry out, at which point things will start browning in that butter nicely. And once that happens, we want to continue cooking until these take on a really beautiful deep rich color, which for me looks something like this. And then once that's been accomplished, we will stop and add our flour. And we'll go ahead and stir that in. And we will cook that for about three minutes, just to take the raw edge off that flour. At which point we'll stop and add the rest of the ingredients. Okay, so to recap, first we made it wet. Then we made it dry, which is where we're at now. Now we're going to make it wet by adding a spoon of ketchup a little bit of Worcestershire sauce, and then three cups of the finest beef broth you can find. All right, preferably low sodium, and we'll go ahead and stir all that together still on high heat. And if there was ever a recipe where you wanted to splurge on a nice beef broth, this would be the one. In fact, you may even want to consider splurging for one of those fancy bone broths, which by the way are exactly the same as regular beef broth, but they do tend to be a little higher quality and lower in salt, which since we are going to reduce this a little bit, is an advantage. But anyway, we'll stir all that together and bring it to a simmer over high heat, at which point we'll reduce that to medium and simmer it for about 10 minutes, stirring occasionally until it reduces a little bit and thickens up. And if everything's gone according to plan, looks like this, which I think is just absolutely gorgeous. And if you want to give that a taste for salt, go ahead. But mine was perfect. And then once that's done, we'll go ahead and transfer it into some kind of measuring cup or bowl. And we'll make sure we use a spatula to scrape that pan as clean as we can. And that's it, once our gravy's done, we'll simply reserve that until needed. And yes, I am doing this backwards. Most recipes have you cook your Salisbury steaks first, and then you remove those from the pan, and then make your gravy, and then put it all together. But I think this method works out so much better, and is much easier logistically when we're ready to serve. And that's it, we'll return our scraped clean pan to the stove, where we will eventually fry our Salisbury steaks in some melted butter. But before that happens, we have to form them which I'm gonna do, of course, with some damp hands, since damp hands make smooth Salisbury steaks. So we'll moisten our hands with a little bit of water, and then we'll take one quarter of our mixture, 
and form it into a patty about a half inch thick. And while oval is the most traditional shape, you could make these round if you want, or I guess square, or triangular if you're really weird. So do them how you want. I mean, you are after all the Dr. James Salisbury of how the shape might vary, but the point is it really doesn't matter as long as they're about a half inch thick. And before we fry these up, I do like to season both sides with some salt. Although be careful, especially if you used a cheap beef broth, which tend to be a lot saltier, and depending on how salty your gravy already tastes, you may want to skip this step. But anyway, I did put a little bit on mine. And that's it, we're gonna go ahead and brown those up in a couple tablespoons of butter that we have set over medium high heat in our previously used pan. And we are only gonna cook these for about two to three minutes per side, or just enough time to get a little bit of browning on the surface. Okay, one of the secrets to a great Salisbury steak is finishing cooking them in the gravy. So like I said, we'll just give those a couple minutes per side. And because of the egg and the breadcrumb in our mixture, that is still gonna be plenty of time to get some decent color. And then what we'll do to finish these is simply transfer in our gravy. And then as soon as that starts to simmer, which is only gonna take a couple minutes, we will back our heat down to medium and simply cook these for about five more minutes basting with a spoon or until our Salisbury steaks are just cooked through. And this is not something we're trying to catch at medium rare or medium. All right, it's perfectly fine, if not better, that these cook all the way through. And since they're only a half inch thick, that's only gonna take maybe four or five minutes. And one way to test, which I didn't show, is just poke them with your finger. And if they feel mushy, they're not done. But if they spring back and feel a little bit firm, they are. And that's it, once those are cooked, we'll go ahead and serve them up. Preferably next to some buttered mashed potatoes and the vegetable side of your choice. And of course, we'll spoon over a very generous amount of that gravy which is not only one of the best tasting brown gravies ever, but probably the most beautiful. I mean, come on, look at that. And no, in case you're under 50, the ones in the TV dinner did not look this good. But anyway, let me go ahead and grab a fork so I can make sure it tastes as good as it looks. And I am very happy to report it did, and then some. This really was fantastic. All right, what we have here is just big beefy flavor and a surprisingly tender texture. Plus, like I already said, one of the most amazingly delicious gravies you will ever taste. I mean, even if you never make the steaks, you should still make this gravy, even if it is just to serve with mashed potatoes. Oh, and one interesting thing here, you heard me name check James Salisbury earlier. He was the doctor that this ground meat patty was named after, since he actually prescribed it for dietary reasons for his patients. But ironically, his was just a very lean patty that was broiled and then just served with some Worcestershire sauce on the side. So I don't believe if he was alive today that he would be very amused that this is the rich and decadent dish we're calling Salisbury steak. But anyway, it doesn't matter. He's dead. Whoops, hold on. My melted butter dam broke. Let me fix that. There we go. But anyway, that's it. My take on the Salisbury steak. Whether you're going to eat this at the dining room table or you're going to find an old episode of The Ed Sullivan Show on the YouTube app on your smart TV, and eat this in front of the screen like you're supposed to. Either way, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.